Mr. Hatfield, thank you so much for joining us today. We're looking forward to our conversation. Um, and I thought what we might do is start with a few questions about what it was like um, to live in Woodland a few years ago uh, and what your experience was like. And so my first question that I have for you today um, is I'd like you to take us back to Woodland in the late 1930s during the Great Depression. And do you think you could paint a picture for us of what Woodland community looked like when you were a high school student? I think I could do that. Okay. <laughs> um, in my senior year of high school, uh, every day I would come down and see the dredges digging that new channel for the river. And of course, uh, Woodland used to be the river capital <laughs> of the area. And, uh, and there was no way to get from Vancouver to Woodland except by going by river. Yeah. Unless you wanted to swim a little bit. <laughs> and this, it looks like this part of Woodland is gradually becoming more of a uh, industrial center than uh, the one downtown that I remember as Woodland. Uh, all these uh, traffic circles <laughs> took a little bit of uh, used to getting to it. I've seen them in England, and I've never seen them in uh, Woodland. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I suppose you'll learn how to negotiate them. And uh, those buildings downtown look just about the same as they do now when I was in school. But we did have a theater down there. Uh, and uh, do they still have a theater in town? Not that operates. Uh, the, um, uh, not right close to the theater was uh, Neil's Rendezvous, mm -hmm. which was our place to go get milkshakes and hamburgers. Um, the farmers co-op, I think, was maybe the industrial center of Woodland then. Wouldn't be now. I see Walmart out here. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I, uh, I, I know when you travel on I-5, remember that underneath you, is what used to be the bottom of the Lewis River. You knew that, didn't you? Uh, the uh, uh, battery of dredges uh, dug the um, uh, new channel, and as the dirt was uh, dug, it was sucked up uh, pipes that were full of water, and they carried the dirt out to the the roadside, not the roadside, uh, where the uh, uh, later route of the I-5 was. And um, it was exciting to watch the dredges at work. Mr. Stroud, uh, one of our science teachers, used to take kids on field trips up to the new bridge. Uh, they had to build that new bridge, not new to you, that uh, uh, so that you didn't have to go over the old bridge and then around the, ro the wrong way to the center. Would you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> That's the way you got to Vancouver. You went to the center. So, I mean, the community looks significantly different in some ways. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, there's not as many logging trucks going through it, I think. Yeah. Oh, well. Uh, and uh, we never had Mexican restaurants. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now we have all sorts of restaurants yeah. in Woodland. So one of the things I, I thought we might talk to or talk about um, is that our own students have uh, lived through some significant events, um, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq uh, and living in a post 9-11 mm -hmm. world. Um, but when you, were, when you were a student, what sense um, or awareness did you have of the global events that were going on while you were in high school? We had the radio. Yeah. Were you, were you aware uh, of what was happening in Asia and in, in Europe with the, the building up for the war? 
Well, certainly in Europe, uh, not so much in Asia, but uh, the, um, yeah, I, some of us did anyway, and uh, uh, I've always been one that keeps up on what's going on in the world. Um, of course, it, it, more, it was more immediate then, mm -hmm. because you knew that you might be getting a letter from the draft board uh, t telling you that your friends and neighbors had decided it was time for you to serve in the military. And that made it more immediate. Now you don't get those letters anymore, do you? Mm -hmm. I don't think there's been a draft since, what, 1972 or so? Since Vietnam. But um, that brings it closer to you life, of course, with you. I firmly believe, uh, this may not be the place to mention it, but I believe in a universal uh, service where uh, everybody and all the young people in, have to perform some kind of uh, service to the, their nation. Uh, other nations have it, and I think we should do how, how aware, you said that you had the radio as kind of a way to find out about what was going on in the world. Mm -hmm. Did you, um, was that something you listened to routinely throughout the day? Did you talk about world events at school? It depended on the subject matter class. and uh, I don't know. I, as a teacher, I remember that first time I realized that the electronic world was going to be impinging on my own teaching. Uh, I saw a kid uh, sitting with a wire going out of his ear, and uh, it was during World Series time. And so I asked uh, Kent, uh, what is that wire going out of your ear? And he said, well, I'm listening to the World Series. <laughs> And I told him, well, give us some reports, would you? <laughs> and now I guess uh, you get the, the texting going on, probably. Some of you probably texting right now. <laughs> and um, uh, I don't know what you do about, I don't know what your teachers do about that. Uh, we give them stern looks. Well, yeah. So in some of your, your classes, your teachers talked to you about what was going on in the world or maybe talked about the rise of Hitler in Europe, um, but not necessarily mm -hmm. in every class that wasn't so commonplace. I remember Mr. Stroud taking us back from a debate tournament and having the radio turned on and uh, uh, learning that uh, what the status of the war was in Europe. Of course, uh, the United States got into it uh, after Pearl Harbor, or immediately after Pearl Harbor, and uh, uh, and I heard over the radio that uh, I think this was during the um, the false war or something like that. Uh, for a long time, uh, Germany poised its forces before they, uh, and took up positions, and, and there was the phony war or something like that. But um, the night we, that the class of 40 got their diplomas, uh, was the night that they were evacuating Dunkirk, France, uh, some 300,000 or so uh, Allied soldiers, mostly French and English, were being, uh, they were surrounded by the German forces and, uh, and boats came by the hundreds uh, to take anybody that was standing on the beach or waiting in the water back to uh, England. There's a movie about that. I don't remember what the name <laughs> is, but the, Anyway. 
And I want us to talk about about your experience in World War II. It's, yeah. um, it's on our agenda to talk about today. Um, but I do want us to talk about this beautiful new building that we're in. Um, and I know you've been given a tour yeah. of our high school oh, and yeah. traveled around yeah, town a little bit. So um, what have you noticed about our new school that's surprising or yeah. interesting to you? I asked a lot of questions. Uh, a very nice freshman student uh, took me around, Samantha something. <laughs> And uh, I asked her questions about specific things that I wanted. I wanted to know, for example, do you have a cafeteria? We had no cafeteria. Mm. Everybody brought their uh, lunches to school, uh, those that remembered, uh, mostly in brown bags. And we all had a place where we put them underneath, uh, underneath the uh, long e uh, incline that led up to the upper we didn't have steps on that on the building, just a long, long incline. And uh, underneath that incline, there was a big shelf where you put your lunch. Mine disappeared about once a month. Uh, I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. And I asked about the gymnasium, of course. Uh, we had a tiny, tiny gym inside the original building and we actually uh, basketball play, uh, players actually played in that gymnasium but uh, after uh, our new principal came we got a, a nice new gymnasium I used to sneak into it at night and uh, I knew how to get in <laughs> and I'd find a basketball that somebody had left on the in the gym floor and I'd shoot baskets uh, I, it's too late for the uh, uh, for me to be uh, punished for that, I guess. <laughs> but I did that, and uh, it was a beautiful gymnasium, I thought. And I saw your gymnasium, and I saw your uh, uh, weight training room and all that, and I'm just amazed. Um, see, I covered the lunches, the basketball floor. Do you still have uh, do you, you still have homecoming bonfires? Probably not, right? No bonfires. Well, I understand why not. <laughs> I think uh, Ralph Bozarth and Ralph Bryan, two of the boys in my uh, class, uh, put an end to that when they just about burned down one end of the grade school, which was not close, far off. <laughs> You burned half the leaves off the uh, uh, big old maple tree. It's still there, but uh, I think. <laughs> but uh, when the big windstorm came in Columbus Day, 1962, they had a lot of refuse around, and they did have a bonfire that year, I understand. Mm -hmm. But it's not a good idea. The crowd couldn't even get close enough to the bonfire to really feel like they were doing something together. Okay. Did you get a chance to go out to the, to the football stadium? No, but I watched, I saw it from a distance, yeah. Very nice. Uh, and you had lights too. <laughs> we never had lights. <laughs> all, all of the, uh, all of the uh, football games, were played in the afternoon, uh, which was not a bad thing for students that wanted to get out of school because the school was just, um, had it, it just stopped mm -hmm. at noon and uh, after lunch uh, we, we were on our own. What the kids did was to uh, form a big serpentine in front of the school and they would go hold hands and they would serpentine up the street toward the what was then the main city center uh, chanting uh, something like um, your pep your pep you got it now keep it doggone it don't lose it your pep your pep all the way uptown mm -hmm. and then the cheerleaders would lead a few cheers and then we'd come back in and serpentine our way back again 
guess you don't do it anymore, right? No. <laughs> Well, but I know you got pep. <laughs> we're going to take a quick pause because yeah. the students are um, going to be finishing up with their second period class. And so the bell is going to ring, and I don't want that to interrupt um, what you have to say. Yeah. And then we'll pick back up with, uh, in about five minutes. This is Mr. Lewis Hatfield, who is a graduate from the class of 1940. Uh, and uh, I'm Mrs. Sherry Condit, who's a history teacher here at Woodland High School. And, um, we are in the second part of an interview that we started about 25 minutes ago. Um, and Mr. Hatfield has talked to us a little bit about what it was like to live in Woodlands during the time period um, of the 1930s and the 1940s. And we've discussed a little bit about what his experience was living um, and being a high school student and as World War II was breaking out. And um, he's taken a tour of the new high school and he's just made a couple comments about what that experience was like. And so. We're just going to go ahead and pick up with our questions mm -hmm. uh, and then our response. And then um, you'll have an opportunity to ask some questions, too, if you have it. And, and then Mr. Hatfield will want to mm -hmm. kind of fill in some missing pieces for us as well. So um, we'll pick up with our interview, Mr. Hatfield. So All we've right. been talking about what it was like to, to live here at the time. And um, are there some things that uh, about your life outside of school, your home life, mm -hmm. that is very different from maybe what our students' home life uh, might well, be like. maybe not, <laughs> and maybe. Yeah. But uh, I, I in uh, my class had a 60th reunion at the oak tree, of course. And uh, one thing that always bothered me when I was in high school, we had an outdoor toilet, and uh, I was uh, really uh, kind of ashamed of it. <laughs> when people came to our house that they had to go outdoors to go to the toilet. Uh, so I just had a show of hands. I said, how many of you had outdoor toilets? And it turned out about 50% of them did. Not the ones that lived in Woodland, but the ones that lived in up the river and in the far off uh, uh, part of the area. And I remember in uh, maybe 1936 or 37, uh, the WPA came around with kits, toilet kits. They, had, uh, they were very well designed and very sanitary. Uh, they had, um, and very well ventilated, screened and everything else. And the, uh, Toilet seats would be held up by a kind of an arm, a wooden arm, that was fastened by a block and tackle to the doorway. And if you forgot to put the lid down, when you opened up the door, it would slam down behind you. And on a warm uh, summer day, uh, every once in a while you hear a slam someplace in Jenny Quick Valley where I lived at the Jack or Jaskeries or the Alancos or one of the other neighbors. And, and I'd know that somebody forgot to put the toilet seat down. And, <laughs> uh, and then, uh, I don't know, do they still have outdoor toilets? <laughs> Not even up the Lewis River? <laughs> well, okay, that's fine. That's what I want to know. <laughs> yeah. um, and telephones. Uh, a lot of us didn't have telephones in 1940. And about 50% didn't have telephones. In fact, if you come right down to, down to it, a couple of kids in the class came from uh, uh, homes without electricity. Uh, if you have studied US history, you know that the Roosevelt administration, that's one of the big things that they tried to stress was getting electricity to the rural areas. And there were a lot of places that, uh, I could name names, but I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> it would be em embarrassed the few people in the class that are still around. And one of the people in the class who lived up in the Ariel Dam uh, area had no floor in their house, just a dirt floor. But of course, the town kids had all those things, and that's the way it was. Were there telephones at the school? 
in the indoor bathrooms were in school? I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. I worked in the office and um, I used to type up a lot of forms and things like that. And one time uh, I got hold of I was of the salaries that teachers got in those days, and I was really appalled. Well, I thought it looked pretty good to me then, but you know, uh, a lot of teachers got less than a hundred dollars a a month for their teaching. The highest paid faculty member on the staff was the uh, vocational ed and agriculture teacher because he got a little supplement from the Smith Hughes Act. Do you have any uh, people who are hearing challenged, by the way? Uh, any students in the uh, school? Yes. I have in my retinue <laughs> uh, my daughter who is a uh, uh, pretty much uh, one of the most knowledgeable people in the state on uh, uh, hearing and speech problems. And uh, she's, uh, she just retired after a full lifetime. And I was in awe of what she had, what she accomplished. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, cut it off, right? <laughs> 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 but there she is. That, that's a... Um, my daughter, Nancy. I was wondering if you might be able to talk um, to us about what your high school experience was like, and, and maybe you could address the classes that you took or the sports that were available, the types of clubs, mm -hmm. um, and other social activities that students could participate in. Um, we had two main sports for the boys. Uh, none for the girls. They had play days and uh, uh, something called GAA, Girls Athletic Association. Uh, well, we did have a basketball team and uh, for the girls. It was not a league team. I think there were only about four schools in all of Clark County, uh, Clark College County that had uh, women's basketball. And it was the, you, if you saw it today, you would think it's pretty strange. They had a, six girls on a team. Three of them could only play on one side of the middle line. The other three got all the scoring. Of course, you could be ch changed around in the course of the game and so forth. Three on this side and three on that side. And the dribbling was limited. You can only dribble so many times. It was to protect the physical well-being of the girls, I guess. Ha uh ha. -huh. <laughs> and then in 1972, this Title IX Act came along, and what do you know? The girls got as many sports as the boys did. I say, that's great. You got golf teams, tennis teams, uh, softball teams. It's wonderful. What sort of classes did you take when you were a student here? I never stinted. I took the hardest program I could, except nobody told me how important algebra would be in my life. And somehow I got plain geometry and solid geometry, but I never got algebra. And uh, Years later, I had to drop my physics class in college because I couldn't solve the problems without algebra. Remember that. <laughs> uh, the math teachers I, yeah. will appreciate that plug that you just gave them. Yeah, and I, I, liked, I liked English, drama, things like that. We didn't have drama classes, but we had uh, and, and home, boys home ec. I learned a lot of boys home ec. <laughs> Uh, for one thing, I learned about deodorant. <laughs> Great discovery. <laughs> so did they separate the boys and the girls in their home ec classes? Oh, no, no. Oh, well, no. The girls had to put on a banquet for the boys, and the boys had to put on a banquet for the girls. So did you I learn cooking the first, skills? What? Did you learn cooking skills? Yeah, sure. The uh, first thing we learned was to make white sauce. Um, 
And I don't remember everything, but uh, some of the uh, things we made, upside down, pineapple upside down cake. Um, one kitchen was a little bit too quick to take it out of the oven, and it, when they cut into it, it went all over the plate. But, and uh, candy, at Christmas we made candy. And um, we learned, uh, Mrs. McNall, the homemade teacher, probably taught me more than anybody else. <laughs> that starting with the deodorant. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, uh, I don't think we had a very good counseling department. I don't say that in a critical way. Maybe a lot of schools didn't have a counseling department. But it sure would have helped to have somebody tell me what classes would be most helpful in, in college preparation. You guys are lucky. <laughs> What are your fondest memories of that time? The football and basketball games. <laughs> and uh, I like the uh, serpentining up to the town and hollering, uh, your pep, your pep, doggone it. You got it, now keep it, doggone it, don't lose it. <clears throat> and uh, I like that part of it. I liked uh, being in the band and orchestra. Uh, Mr. Glasgow was um, our music teacher, and he was just a fine, uh, not that I'm a great musician or anything, but they were t teaching, uh, they had a band instructor, the above WPA band instructor that came to the center and Woodland, and I played in both of the town bands. They couldn't find a, uh, uh, yeah, I'm wandering a little bit. I'm div diverting from your question, but uh, I uh, I didn't have an instrument, so Mr. Parvin, the WPA instructor, said, "I think we got a valve trombone. Have you ever seen a valve trombone?" My husband's a, drum a trombone. They player. don't do this. No. <laughs> it's more a, like a trumpet. It got, it's like a, a baritone horn. Same. Uh, pitch level and uh, same uh, fingering. And so then I switched to the euphonium or the uh, baritone. And uh, I had a vague background in violin. And so I played the violin in the orchestra. I like that. I like music. I just liked high school. <laughs> you did. One thing I didn't like was walking to a school bus. When uh, my family first moved out here, they uh, bought a little house on uh, Jenny Creek Valley. I don't know, do you know what Jenny Creek Valley is? It's about a mile and a half from the center. And that first uh, day that my brother Harlan and I were, had to decide which high school to go to, there were two buses that went by the door. One was the center, and one was Woodland. And we got on the Woodland one, I think, maybe by mistake. And so for the rest of our high school career, we were beavers. <laughs> the rest of the kids in the family went to the center. A after the first month or so of being picked up at the door, the Le Center and the Woodland school boards got their heads together and decided to divide it up. They divide up the roots differently. Then I had to walk two miles to catch the bus. I didn't like that part. <laughs> However, <laughs> during prune ripening season, I sure enjoyed uh, robbing the prune orchards on the way <laughs> and filling my pockets with prunes. And <laughs> yeah. yes. But uh, I probably should have been in cross country, but we had no cross country team. I must have walked back and forth between Woodland and our house and Jenny Creek. Uh, sometimes twice in a day. It's about five miles. Or I'd run it if I was uh, in a hurry and uh, 
I would have made a good cross country uh, runner. Uh, maybe not so good football. I should show you the picture sometime of our football team. You <laughs> won't believe it. They look so scrawny compared to the big sluggers <laughs> that they've got on their numbers. Uh, I've gone to many football games in the last few years where there are 300 and more pound uh, players. Are you got any on the wooden team? 300 pounds? Have you? How heavy are you? We were lucky to get anybody even close to 200 pounds. <laughs> and a lot of our players would be 135 or 40 pounds. And, yeah. But they were good. <laughs> uh, we had a, uh, a principal here called Porter Lanehart. You could look it up. And uh, he came from Goldendale High School, I think. Was an all-star player at WSU. I think he was may have been an All-American for his punting ability. Anyway, he had a team, that, Woodland, that went over 20 games without being defeated. And they'd clean up on Longview and <laughs> Vancouver and everybody around. That was before I went here. And um, We had to renovate the baseball field before we could uh, play baseball uh, because it had been kind of left to uh, deteriorate. Uh, but we had some pretty good baseball players. And track was a very uh, poorly organized sport until Mr. Fuller came here. Mr. Fuller was a an all-American basketball player, Johnny Fuller, you can look it up, <laughs> at the University of Washington. He was a Husky. And uh, the visiting uh, House of David and other basketball teams that came here got the shock of their life. <laughs> we had a, a Mr. Fuller and one of the junior high school uh, teachers that had been an ex-all-star basketball player and sometimes they'd clean up on these visiting teams. Uh, but Johnny was, John was a wonderful man, just wonderful. Um, he called me into his office one spring and he said, uh, are you inter interested in going to college? And I said, well, I had it in the back of my mind. My dad worked in WPA. In your history classes, do you know what WPA was? They'll you, get to it soon. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know it, it's in yeah. later on here. But uh, the, um, uh, in the, uh, the Depression, the Great Depression, uh, the, they needed, uh, Roosevelt and his administration set up make work programs. And one of them was WPA. My dad got $64 a month for working on WPA. And uh, then he also, Roosevelt also started something called CCC. It was a wonderful program. It would take uh, young uh, kids uh, in, from the cities especially who had uh, no jobs, and he would put them out in the forest someplace where they did uh, things like uh, clearing forest trails and uh, opening up uh, forest fire institutions. There's a lot of places around here that were built by the CCC, including the La Center, former La Center High School. Not CCC, it was built by the WPA. And uh, we didn't, uh, my dad didn't make very much money. <laughs> Let's put it that we had uh, six kids and uh, it had to go a long ways. And, and so I didn't, I wasn't able to, I, I didn't afford a, uh, I couldn't afford a student body car. <laughs> they cost something like a dollar and a half. And sometimes uh, I couldn't ride the router bus because I didn't have a nickel for that. Once they, my friend sneaked me on board the router bus and we made it. <laughs> but, um, oh, and, the, and we didn't have a cafeteria 
We didn't have any Hot Meals, uh, but we did have an FFA candy bar. It was at the entrance to the school, the old school, and for five cents a piece, you could get a pretty good uh, candy bar. And then sometimes the home ec department girls would uh, make pies, and that was five cents too. Uh, so it wasn't as though we didn't have anything to eat. <clears throat> it's just, I don't think the dietitians would have approved of it. <laughs> and now you've got this wonderful cafeteria, and I suppose you all love all the food that they gave down there. And <laughs> well, I thought we might mm. might transition a little bit um, and talk about post high school um, yeah. and mm -hmm. uh, like the opportunities that existed for you and your classmates after you left. I know that um, you shared with me uh, that that many of your classmates joined the armed services, um, and this is at <clears> the time <throat> of World <throat> War II breaking out. So I thought maybe you might share with us the reasons behind uh, joining the military and the impact that that had on your life. Well, the main reason for joining the military was your letter from your draft board. And I managed to go until my uh, sophomore year of college before I got my letter. They just tell you the, your draft board, your friends and neighbors, have decided that you're ripe for the military. And they tell you where to report for your physical. And my, I had to go to Seattle to the, what used to be the former Rhodes department store and take my physical. And you didn't get much choice. When I was there, I think they had uh, uh, 10 openings for the Navy. And I don't know how many for the Marine Corps, but there was a special team that went around feeling muscles and looking at all the big guys. I told them that the Army uh, had some pretty good fighters too, <laughs> but they didn't pay much attention to me. That's the way it goes when you weren't very big. If you, if you got a picture of the class of 1940 when uh, they were juniors, <laughs> you'll find me up at the top row, uh, about four from the end. A uh, very impressive looking kid, but um, mm -hmm. and I've changed, of course, now. I'm a very <laughs> impressive 92-year-old man, <laughs> but um, I hope that we've uh, stayed in, on track enough so you can understand. Uh, the motto of my class was, not at the top, but climbing. I don't know if we ever got there. <laughs> I'm the only guy left, but um, but I'm speaking for my class. I, I the more I thought about it, the more I thought somebody. We were a good class. We were very intelligent and superior and achieving, and somebody has to tell people about us. Uh, maybe you saw uh, the Planners Day Parade about, what, I don't know, 12 years ago? When the class of 1940, uh, I entered them as an entry. <laughs> and we got some, Margaret and, and my daughter Nancy got some classic cars for us. And uh, uh, we went in the parade, and I got, uh, and she made a banner, and that they carried us as, the class of 1940 is celebrating its 70th reunion. The geezer beavers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then uh, we, they got, my daughter uh, Tricia bought a bunch of uh, a candy or some, but it wasn't that great. I don't know how many parents enjoyed having their kids picking up candy cigars and candy cigarettes, but <laughs> somehow or another she came up with these things that just aren't on the shelves anymore. Uh, and we had to throw that out. Uh, when we got about, um, um, Nancy made us all t-shirts that 
with my picture on. And then uh, when they got at a certain point in the parade, uh, my son-in-law, her husband, uh, came out with a boom box and they played Louie Louie. <laughs> and they started dancing around. The, you know, what did they call those? Flash? A flash mob in the middle of the Planners' Day Parade. Uh, I didn't even know it was happening. <laughs> they told me later on. But oh. And then she made uh, uh, plasticized eight and a half by 11 inch pictures from this annual here and uh, of each one of us that was in the parade. And as we rode along in our classic cars, we'd hold up these eight and a half by 11 inch plasticized pictures beside our face so they could see what we, how we had changed. And uh, anyway, it was a, a really a, a great thing to be in the parade. And I'm going to be in the Veterans Parade this Saturday up in Auburn, Washington. Not, not, not uh, Maine Marshall, but uh, just one of the boys. Well, speaking of your military yeah. service, um, I'm sure that you and your fellow classmates witnessed some significant tragedy during your years of service. Um, as you think back about your service to the country, what are some of the takeaway messages that you have from your time in, in the military? Join the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> or better yet, join, the, join something else. <laughs> That doesn't, I mean, in the Navy, you can get shot, you can get sunk, and uh, something terrible happens to you. We had, there were, uh, down at the Woodland uh, uh, Historical Museum, I counted eight people that were in school uh, when I was that were listed on the dead, the uh, uh, mortalities from uh, different wars. And I'm sure that it wasn't even up to date. Um, I was in the infantry, the 71st Infantry Division. Um, I don't claim to be a war hero. I was not in on the Normandy invasion or the uh, Battle of the Bulge. But for eight or 900 miles, my division chased the Germans. And um, yes, I've, uh, I've seen some bodies and uh, I know what a German machine gun sounds like when it goes over your head. It sounds like, uh, kind of like a zipper. <laughs> brrp, brrp, very fast firing. And I've been fired on by uh, my unit by 88 uh, caliber uh, guns. The Germans developed a very large gun, the 88, uh, that uh, could lay down a real zone of fire. And um, I remember when I saw my first casualties with olive drab uniform, American uh, uniforms on and how uh, devastating it was, and uh, I've been I've I've, uh, I've been housed overnight in a uh, German pillbox on the um, Siegfried Line. The Siegfried Line was a, a final defense uh, line, just full of concrete pillboxes and tank traps and everything else. And my division was supposed to attack it, uh, but Patton, bless his heart, <laughs> General Patton uh, came around behind and crossed the Rhine, and they had to get out in a hurry, and we just walked through and walked right through. And we stayed that one night in a, a very large German pillbox. It was so large, it had been bombed and had a big crater in the top didn't even phase it. Uh, my entire squad lived in that, uh, spent the night in that pillbox, and I uh, laid my head on the rubber tire of the 
tank gun that was uh, inside the pillbox. And in the morning, when I was just waking up, a couple guys from the unit started messing around with that 75 caliber gun. The breech was open about that far, and they, I think they were going to pull the breech open. And one of the sergeants said, wait a minute. <laughs> Let me look inside the breach with this flashlight. And so he looked inside, and there was a whole nest of concussion grenades. I tell my family that none of them would be around now if those guys had gotten that breach open. Don't I? <laughs> um, but. It's mostly hardship. It's mostly uh, forming scrimmage lines and going through woods and to see if there were any Germans that had uh, set up uh, last minute uh, uh, barricades or, uh, and we had a few of those. And we'd round up, always, almost always we'd round up a bunch of Germans that were willing to uh, some of them eager <laughs> to uh, give up. And one time at the end of a long, harrowing day, I was a 60 millimeter mortar a gunner. Uh, I got tired, and we had a big, a huge a German paratrooper who had uh, surrendered in the woods, and I told him to carry my mortar. <laughs> of course, he didn't have the shell that went in it, but, uh, or the base plate, but he carried it for me, like a good scout. <laughs> I, I have a lot of experiences like that. Hmm? Your division liberated a concentration camp. Oh my goodness, I forgot that. <laughs> uh, when we got to Austria, we began to see uh, very haggard uh, uh, practically like s skeletons, uh, uh, people staggering along the roads on each side, and they were uh, had been inmates in uh, a German concentration camp in uh, Austria called Gunskirchenlager, and um, uh, we liberated it. It was about, uh, it was on May, May 4th, just before the end of the war. And uh, uh, they wanted to, they came up around you and they wanted to touch you or kiss your boots or something. And they did not smell good, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> Nothing against them. <laughs> and anyway, uh, after the war, I, uh, Margaret and I, Margaret's my wife, uh, signed up for a return trip to combat. We uh, traveled in buses uh, down the same route that we had in combat. And um, I had called the Holocaust Museum and I asked them if, if there'd be any possibility to talk to one of the inmates that was freed in uh, February 4th. And one day up in Federal Way when uh, Margaret and I were having dinner, I got a call on the phone from a man named Meyer Leibowitz. And uh, he had been a 14-year-old boy as an inmate in Gunskirk and Lager. And he was crying on the phone. And he was so happy to talked to a, a member of the division that had liberated him. It was very moving. He saved his life. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. And uh, one of the regiments, there are three regiments in the division. My uh, regiment was the 14th, and we just kept on with what we were doing, which was trying to wipe up the Germans. Uh, but the Fifth Infantry Division, uh, which contained my my buddy from the class of 1940, Harold Clark, 
uh, was assigned to uh, help take the food into them and the medical uh, uh, supplies and all the rest of the things that had to be done. But uh, in 19, uh, what year was it? Anyway, it was exactly 50 years later that our, our tour got to the, uh, where the concentration camp had been. And of course it was gone now, but there's a, a, a very young forest growing up in the same area. But we went through a very moving ceremony with, with involving candles and uh, a band that played and one of our uh, division members played the violin and, uh, and there was uh, speeches and uh, some kind of ceremony that the Jewish people go through for the dead people. And uh, I, I had a, a long talks with Meyer Berkowitz and his wife and, uh, and daughter. And um, that's why that was extraordinarily moving. Uh, well, this might be a good time um, for us to, to break a little bit and offer the students an opportunity to ask some questions that they may have um, about your experience um, in fighting, your experience afterwards, um, or maybe what it was like to be a Woodland High School student. Um. Yeah. How did you feel when you got drafted? When how you got you, the draft letter? How did you feel when you got your draft letter? When I got my draft notice? Mm -hmm. What are you going to feel? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I guess it'll be something different. <laughs> yeah. I was uh, in a, uh, actually for a while, I was in, um, went to the University of Idaho in a special uh, basic engineering program. They needed engineers. <laughs> and uh, I was in it for six months before they decided they didn't need it anymore. And uh, so uh, that was six months I didn't have to go into combat. Uh, but I was, uh, some of the uh, fellows that had been in basic training with me uh, were in the uh, landings and the uh, South Pacific, Marshall and Kwajalein Islands. And we got KIA letters on them. The KIA is killed in action. And uh, so I was just as glad to be at the University of Idaho then. Then after they canceled the university, the uh, basic engineering program, I was sent to an experimental division with about 20 vehicles and about 2,000 mules. And uh, they lined us up, and the, the 40 highest, I think, tallest, uh, were muleteers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I had to, do, to join that outfit. I never did get too uh, well acquainted with any of the mule, mules, but I sure know how to, I know the nomenclature of the mule and the, uh, uh, and, uh, and we, had, we were each issued a, uh, a machete. And so we made some pretty uh, interesting just guesses on where we were going to be, which was probably Burma. <laughs> but um, then they decided that wasn't a practical thing. And so I was uh, in the division was reconstructed, reorganized as a quadrangular or triangular division. And uh, and that delayed me for getting overseas until January of 1945. Uh, just as well. <laughs> and uh, how, do, how did I feel? Well, my mom worried a lot. She had three of us boys in the service and uh, my brother Harlan, who was a sophomore at um, Woodland High School when I left, was in a, was a, a crew member on a, a, a B-24. Uh, he went through two years of training and uh, uh, was made a navigator. 
And uh, his plane went on one mission <laughs> over Munich and uh, sustained uh, aircraft fire uh, damage to their hydraulic system. They couldn't get back over the mountains. So uh, the pilot said, OK, Harlan, uh, get us over into southeast, uh, southeast uh, Switzerland. And so he did. He navigated them into Switzerland. I've got all of his account, how he felt when he came down under the uh, parachute and saw farmers below with pitchforks and uh, other things and hoped that he was, he, he was right in getting him to the right place. The whole crew got out all right, but um, they smashed the plane into a mountain. And Nancy has visited the site where the plane uh, hit the mountain, haven't you? Yep. Do we have any other questions? Huh? How many people do you think you saved? Who wants to know how many people do you think you saved? That I what? That saved? you saved. Oh, the, in the, um, I had uh, a pretty good estimate. There were about, in the, the uh, concentration camp, uh, I know it was over 10,000. They were uh, uh, mostly from Hungary. And, um, oh, there's a story there, too. <laughs> Meyer Berkowitz was just a kid. He was only 14. And uh, he and all the rest of the Hungarians had been marched, uh, forced marched from Mauthausen, another concentration camp. And he told me about uh, life there. His whole family except for one brother, were killed in the gas chamber in Auschwitz. And um, I don't know where Meyer is now. I tried to, I looked up, I Googled uh, Meyer Berkowitz, and I think there must be about two dozen around in the, the United States alone. And uh, I called one of them that looked like he might be a promising, but the Meyer Berkowitz that answered uh, was very suspicious, and he said, "Who are you anyway?" <laughs> <laughs> and I tried to uh, assure, uh, to uh, uh, tell him that I was just looking for a specific man that I had known in the, from the concentration camp, and um, but I never located him again, and I. I So you think about 10,000? Yeah. Oh, more than that. Yeah. yeah, there were more than And they were squeezed into maybe 3,000 to a, I don't, you wouldn't dignify them by calling them dorms, but uh, uh, the SS, SS troops uh, were in charge of the prison camps. And of course, they, they Germany had prison camps all over uh, the country. Uh, that'd be a good project for your history classes yeah, to find absolutely. out. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. uh, another one I was thinking about. No, I'm getting off the subject again. Well, we actually have to wrap <laughs> yeah, up our yeah, time yeah. because our students yeah. um, are or finishing up with their third period class. Yeah, and but I am, I'm, I'm beginning, I'm beginning to feel like I'm a little teapot, short <laughs> and stout. Here is my story, no, here is yeah. my handle, here is my spout. Uh, something about tipping me over and pouring me out. <laughs> when I get going, I get going. Well, um, we'd like to thank the students for joining us today and certainly thank you, Mr. Yeah. Hatfield, for, uh, for being yeah. willing to be interviewed and to Thank share you. your story with the students. So students, could you give Mr. Hatfield a hand? Yeah. Thank you for his service. Thank you. Thank you.